Dr. Trey Malone is an extension professor and extension economist with Michigan State University. Dr. Malone's extension program focuses on applying lessons from behavioral economics to increase agricultural productivity and efficiency. A native of Kansas, he earned his undergraduate degree from Rockhurst University. He completed graduate education at Oklahoma State University, where his PhD dissertation used the American beer market to explore the underlying principles of behavioral and experimental economics. Dr. Malone has won multiple research awards and has published dozens of academic articles in journals and has been featured in popular press outlets, including the Washington Post, Vice, Popular Science, and New York Magazine is if you want to sell direct to consumers, you want to do any any type of like non-commodity uh, cash crop agriculture, the first thing you need to understand is know your cost of production. The second thing you need to understand is to know your cost of production. And the third thing you need to understand is to know your cost of production. Um, so, you know, one thing that we've run into a lot here is, is that, you know, people have this idea that maybe they want to get into the, the hemp game uh, or the hops game or whatever it is. Um, but and so they just start planning things uh, and trial by error. They're not really paying attention to what's actually happening on farm uh, to how much their money, their money they're making. Um, and so it, it kind of creates this this massive boom in an industry. The prices drop and then everything falls apart because nobody really did their due diligence in terms of understanding the cost of production side of their business. Um, extension systems across the country have really good support systems. Um, you know, one nice thing about the, the modern era of extension is that you don't necessarily just have to stay in your lane within you know, your home state. Uh, I'm not familiar 100% with what extension services are available in, in uh, Nebraska, but you know, there is the Arkansas Center for Farm and Food that, that does some really great work. Um, if you want to understand the business plan for your, your company uh, and really think through the, the financial decisions, um, you also really want to pay attention to uh, you know, all of the cost of production within the business plan, go to the University of Minnesota's business plan, ag plan website, uh, and it'll walk you through that entire process. Uh, so there's all types of opportunities out there that you might actually be able to, to get involved with. But so let's just say y'all have already done that. You already know your cost of production. You know what you're getting into. Um, you know, now what? Uh, this is maybe, I think, where people run into this this kind of next step where they, they decided not... Uh, they, they figured out, can we grow it? But maybe they didn't think 100% about should we grow it, so to speak. Um, so back to the kind of hops explosion that happened. Uh, you had a lot of people that got into hops, but they didn't really think much about where they were going to sell the hops. So you originally in the boom, you would have people that would literally just go harvest their hops from their backyard acre. Uh, they would put them in a trash bag and walk into their local craft brewery with a trash bag. And they, they'd show up at the brewery and they'd say, hey, brewery, here's my trash bag of hops. Put it in your beer. Um, that's not how this is going to work. Like, like if you want to do specialty crop production and marketing, you're not going to sell much if you just show up with a trash bag of your product. I promise. It's, it, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> um, so, you know, ag production is an important part of the system, but it's just one part of much, much larger supply chains. Even within this kind of hops world, one thing that we ran into was like, yeah, you, you harvested it, but you didn't process it because we didn't have processing capacity in Michigan. So, so you had to maybe go find somebody that would process your hops. And then once you processed your hops, maybe you'd get lucky enough to be able to sell to your local brewery. Um, so, so all of the rest of that to an economist is, is really explained by marketing. Um, so I, I know that people like have this disdain for the concept of marketing. Um, but, but to an economist, it's not just like snake oil promotion to an economist. When I'm talking about marketing, I'm talking about the value add that happens post farm gate. So, so everything along that, like processing producer supply chain post farm gate in my mind is marketing. Um, you know, the, the, the cool, sexy word for it now is supply chain, but, but to me it's marketing. Um, and so this is, I think, what I'd like to at least talk about a little bit. Uh, you know, marketing is this value-added process. You know, it's, it's not as simple as people think. It's way, way, way more complicated. And so if you think you're going to get into some of these specialty crop production systems where maybe you plant, you know, a couple acres of, of uh, apple trees, 
or whatever it's going to be. Um, you're having to make predictions about that marketplace five, 10, 20 years ahead of time. Um, you know, where we're in an annual crop system, I can, you know, I, I can make, you know, fairly rapid decision making. I mean, not rapid in the sense of non ag systems, but in specialty crops, we're playing a different game. Uh, back to hops, we ran into a really big problem where uh, everybody grew Cascade as the cultivar. Uh, and uh, Cascade prices bottomed out, and all of the kind of hipster craft brewers, they wanted the cool, trendy hop. Well, it takes three years for us to grow, grow the cool, trendy hop. So, so, you know, if all of a sudden the brewer decides they want something different, there is this massive pivot that's got to happen in the system. Um, we also are the world or the, the nation's largest chestnut grower. Same story, second verse. Uh, you had the chestnut blight that knocked out all of uh, chestnut production in the United States. Uh, post chestnut blight, we brought it back. We've got this really interesting development in, in chestnut production in Michigan. Uh, but that's a 50 year orchard. Um, and so like if, 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 if you're, you're banking on this idea that chestnut demand is going to increase for the next 50 years, because it's a whole lot of work to get that chestnut orchard established. Um, so, you know, especially when we're talking about the specialty crop production systems, not only is it complicated, but there is a long time lag associated with it. Um, so I, before I get any further in, I would really like it if people just kind of introduce themselves. So I kind of know what types of products we're, we're talking about. One of my big things is that, um, you know, everybody likes to talk about the food supply chain or whatever, but, but I am very empathetically say it's the food supply chains, plural, that are all connected. Because if I'm talking about uh, corn and soybeans, that's a fundamentally different supply chain than if we're talking about pork or poultry or chestnuts or hops or apples uh, or asparagus or hemp or whatever it is. These are all different systems that require different decision making. Um, so, so with that, if we can, let's, let's just kind of open it up and um, I, I'd, I'd just be curious to know who I'm talking to. I'll go first here. Um, my name's Trish and I am an administrative assistant at Community Crops in Lincoln, Nebraska. So my role is really more administrative than the actual gardening itself. Um, but we support um, first time farmers, primarily immigrant farmers to the Lincoln community who are looking to learn how to do agriculture in the United States. So we have a lot of specialty crops like radishes, for example, um, jicama, um, going mostly to local farmers markets or selling directly from our bed GBN at this time, but hoping to establish a larger network in the future. So a pretty unique position probably to others here in the chat. Maybe I'll just go down the line. So so uh, Clarissa Feldman, are you on my, my list next? Are you comfortable with introducing who you are? Yeah, so I'm here on behalf of my personal business, Setting D Ranch in Litchfield, Nebraska, so north of Kearney. Um, beef and pork that we raise, and then also Grow Nebraska, I work for them, so a nonprofit that helps small businesses, well, any business size, I should say, in Nebraska, digitally pivot to the marketplace and offer business resources, and I'm the product manager, so I deal a lot with pricing and helping people get online and listing and connecting, and then I'm also on the board for the Kearney, well, it's more at a given, with Little Town Gardens, we have Farmers Market 365 that we launched. So it is also a nonprofit where we use local producers in the tri state area and do a door drop delivery year round farmers market service. Uh, Derek E. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm Derek Ehlers I'm here in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm owner operator of Root and Hive, which is kind of a unusual um, model. I bought a, a greenhouse nursery in 2015 and have renovated greenhouses and leased them to small scale growers. And um, I work with community crops and uh, Lotus Gardens, which is an aquaculture and um, Midwest native nurseries. So, and then a couple other tenants. All right, uh, Clarissa Feldman. Oh, sorry, you already talked to me. Aaron Campbell. 
Hi, I am an extension educator with Nebraska Extension, and I am located in Shadron. I actually work in the focus area of early childhood, but I'm kind of exploring um, supporting and expanding the, the farm to early child, um, child farm to early child care and education in Nebraska. And so I just want to learn more about all the different aspects of that. Uh, thanks, uh, Kay Walter and Tim Ryan. I'm just going to wait. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks for doing this with us today because this is very helpful. Um, the city of Lincoln, for, in its new comprehensive plan for 2050, just announced that they want building a resilient local food system to be one of the eight pillars of their climate action plan. And the first task in front of us is to actually develop a master plan for food localization. And we don't really know anything about this. Okay, we're, so we're, we're trying to, you know, find land for urban farmers, and we've actually got a line on how to do that, that there's some public land that's going to be available. All right, but even when we have the land, we don't have the farmers at this point. Okay, mm -hmm. and so now we're trying to, you know, start the whole process of grooming the next generation of agricultural producers that will actually be growing food. And we need to um, figure out where these people are going to come from. And if we have young people that want to step up to do this and they've got land now and so forth, how are they going to actually grow for a market that's out there? And of course, we have a lot of eaters in the city of Lincoln, but a lot of these people don't want to eat local food and they don't want to eat fresh food and they don't want to eat healthy food. They want to eat processed food. And so you might have a young farmer getting out there and growing really great radishes and wonderful microgreens and, you know, organic onions and nobody will buy it. So there's a whole bunch of chess pieces that we have to fit together here. And that's why I'm on this call. Because cool. I Thank am you. the chair, I'm the co-chair of this new committee that's supposed to figure out how to do it. And I'll just say that um, Tim and I have a, a, a urban garden that's about, um, about an, almost an acre, not quite. And there are about 20 families that garden with us. Wow. So. My, my immediate thought is, um, so I, I just pulled it up. There's a paper, it's about 10 years old and in, in, uh, it's a rural sociology journal called uh, Ag and Human Values um, that was written by Laura DeLind, who's here at Michigan State. She's retired now, but uh, it's, I, I, I'm happy to send it to you, but it's, it's uh, the, the title of the paper is about local foods. Are we hitching our wagons to the wrong post? I think is the, the title. Uh, and it, it's uh, it's kind of this this long form conversation about the development of the east side of Lansing's food system, um, which was very much rooted less so in in the I think ag food sustainability more and more in community development if that makes sense. Uh, so so Lansing is is a kind of a rust belt blue collar city uh, that that's seen a lot of drastic transition in ind industrial jobs over the last fifty years. Um, and uh, the east side of Lansing is really, uh, t you know, t taken, um, taken up the mantle of, of developing a, a local food system um, in partnership jointly with uh, Michigan State University. So she might be a really good resource. But thank you. anyways, yeah, thank you. OK, so um, let's see. Uh, Ralphie. No. Uh, Rex Nelson. Yeah, I'm an extension educator on the regional foods team, and I work mostly in business uh, business subjects. And the clientele is all across the map in local foods and specialty mm. uh, crops. So the things that you're discussing are close to home and very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and then let's see, Rex Sanquist. All right. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Rex Sandquist, a private citizen here in Lincoln, Nebraska, just kind of looking to learn more about uh, urban farming. I'm an active home gardener and here to just learn about opportunities and resources to connect with the local farming community. And uh, beyond that, I'm part of a private development company working on a mixed use, uh, new urbanist community here in the heart of Lincoln. And we're just kind of looking to learn a little bit more about how to involve the community and um, uh, just kind of um, as we're developing this neighborhood, have community gardens and things like that. So just really here to, to learn and getting our feet wet in the urban gardening world. Yeah, thanks. 
And then uh, finally, Steve Roth, I think, is the last one I saw in there. Steve, you around? Sorry about that. Got me Sorry. now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm with the Nebraska Department of Agriculture. I'm an ag promotion specialist. And I assist in implementing our senior and wet farmers market nutrition programs, as well as the specialty crop block grant programs, which uh, is mostly grant funds for specialty crops. Um, I uh, want to tell Tim, I uh, really appreciate the work you're doing. The biggest challenge I see going forth in, in terms of produce growers is getting young people involved in the industry. Um, having worked with vendors for several years now, uh, our biggest challenge is we lose more than we gain every single year because so many of our producers of our senior age and they're either deciding just not to do it anymore or physically can't do it anymore. So uh, Extension has done a good job of trying to get more young people involved. But to me, that's uh, going to be important. And one of the reasons I'm listening today, just to get an idea of profits, because if you can help these younger people realize that their hard work can pay off, you might be more willing to do it. So I will be an observer. Great. Well, thank you. Okay, so that gives me a much better sense. Um, I mean, like I said, uh, you know, Nebraska is the land of kind of beef cows and, and uh, I up here in Michigan, we have just all kinds of things. Um, you know, so I'm on a kind of a million dollar Great Lakes aquaculture grant. Uh, we've got a grant on uh, morel mushroom cultivation right now that we're working on. Um, we've got, oh, I mean, I, I, we submitted a tart cherry paper last week. Uh, we, we also published something on eye tracking with uh, uh, horticulture products. So uh, um, not, well, horticulture broadly, but, but mostly like uh, potted plants was that paper. Uh, yesterday we published that one. But then last week, I published a paper in the Journal of Rural Studies on social network effects on uh, soybean tillage decisions. So I, I cover literally about as, as broad of uh, topics as, as you can name. And I, I think the, the biggest challenge for somebody who maybe doesn't have the kind of historic ag background. Um, well, and, and I guess I should back up. So I also, for the last two years, have taught our introduction class, our introductory class to ag econ. Uh, it's called Decision Making in the Agri-Food System. Uh, that class has the most students of any uh, College of Ag class at Michigan State University. Um, and it's uh, it has the ag kids, but it's also got a lot of folks who don't really know anything about agriculture or food, but are kind of curious. Um, and so, you know, one thing that I've, I've really tried to double down on is trying to, you know, make this stuff accessible to people, uh, meet them where they're at. Uh, one thing that's beneficial is my dissertation was on the economics of craft beer. Um, and so, you know, if there's one thing that's really accessible to, to East Lansing college kids, it's the economics of beer. Um, and so it's, it's easy to kind of walk back on the supply chain from there. Um, that said, uh, before I went and got my PhD and my master's, um, I took a, a year off. I went to Rockhurst University, which is a Jesuit Catholic school in, in inner city, Kansas City. Uh, and then I took a year off and I lived with a community of religious life in Colorado. Uh, so just outside of Estes Park, Colorado, um, on the peak to peak highway, y'all are in Nebraska, you've been out there. Um, Estes Park somehow has like two University of Nebraska, like spirit st shops, like you can buy UNL stuff at two stores in Estes Park. I don't understand it. Um, but, but if you go out there, uh, I lived in this with this community of religious life and I'll never forget talking to a nun. Uh, from the Denver area, who was very adamant about this concept of no money, no mission. You know, so for as much as, as we want to be able to serve the things and the people that we want to serve without having some funding model, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how great the work is, it's not going to last very long. Um, and so that's, that's kind of been one of my, my big passions for the last, you know, 10 years, really is, is thinking about this, this, this idea of diversifying agricultural systems and, you know, getting young people involved in agriculture, but, but doing it in a way that they, they feel like they're, I don't know, they're, they're a part of something bigger, which is what they want, but also they're not going to get hosed on, on their paycheck. Um, and that's, that's, I think, a, a challenge <laughs> in the modern world that, that we have to deal with, uh, especially during COVID. 
Uh, you know, there is, there's also been this kind of massive chasm that's developing, I think, more and more between urban and rural places, between ag production and, and non-ag production. Uh, I mean, these are ongoing conversations. Um, my, uh, my impression is that uh, the first thing you really want to think about before, like you need to know your cost of production. That's the thing that you need to think about immediately. But the next thing you need to think about is to know exactly who you think you're going to be selling to. Um, you know, it's it's back to my trash bag hop scenario. That's a bad model because you grew it and you didn't talk to anybody before you grew it. Um, with agriculture, all too often, I think we have this, uh, if you grow it, they will come mentality. Um, and, and it just, there, there are a lot of, people out there that are either going to produce low quality product um, or or they're going to create some type of, uh, I think, pressure of competition that you're going to have to try to find your way to navigate through the system. Um, so one thing that I worked on with uh, the hop growers, especially that I thought I would I would highlight here. Um, so so Michigan, by the way, we there are really three really large hop producing states in the country. Uh, they're all in the Pacific Northwest. Michigan is the fourth largest hop producing state in the country, but it's the fourth of three, really. So, I mean, it, we're, we're so far behind the other three, it's, it's kind of hilarious. So um, what we have to figure out is, are we trying to sell a commodity or are we trying to sell something that's more of a value add? Because one thing that you'll learn when you start getting into the cost of production for whatever you're, you're raising, um, the cost of production is going to probably tell you that you are not going to be able to produce it for as cheap as the big players. Um, you know, if, if you try to compete on price with Walmart, you will get stumped. It's just a fact of life. Uh, if you're, if you're, especially if you're valuing your, valuing your labor, which make sure you value your labor. Um, if you really factor in your labor costs, you, you are probably not gonna be able to compete on price. So what you have to think about is instead of that commodity price, you need to think about that premium that you might be able to generate. And so one way that you can generate a premium is by developing kind of a, a niche market for yourself. Um, you know, local is an example of niche, uh, but it's, it's not the only example of niche. It's just one example of many. Uh, I think local value added products is also plays this interesting role for everybody. So in hops, back to my hops example, I think it's just probably helpful because um, I think there was some, some interest a couple of years ago, at least in developing a hop industry in, in Nebraska. I don't know where it's at now. Um, but the, the, the big thing that, that I think it really, I came away with is that like consumers, there's a bunch of research on this, uh, consumers are, uh, more than willing to accept a beer that was brewed locally, but doesn't have any local inputs. Um, so, you know, and that I think is true across the board for so many different agri-food products. Uh, you know, I, I think some, somebody said it, it might've might been Tim said that people like the. Uh, the stuff that's that's already processed and they, they don't want to have to process process it themselves. Well, you know, I I just got a gift of uh, uh, a food product from Greensburg, Kansas, which my family's from out there. So it was really nice that this this uh, producer here in Michigan brought back this thing from from close to my hometown. But there it's a, a pile. They're called duck nuts and they're delicious. But I can promise you the, the peanuts that are in that in that food product did not come from Kansas. Uh, and yet people are still valuing this product and paying the premium for a Kansas product, even though it wasn't really grown there. Um, and so, you know, there, there is this, this uh, I think, tension in here that you really want to try to create something that people can notice and are willing to pay a premium for uh, because it's you, because it's whatever niche you've identified. So let me, let me walk through for the rest of my time, now that I kind of have a sense of where everybody is, let me let me walk through how I, I think I think about at least the promotion side. I think we'll just do that one. Um, like how when I'm thinking about how do I, I grow something and then and then try to reach maybe a viral niche audience of the right people. OK, so back to my. OK. As I mentioned, uh, every system, every supply chain is just wildly complicated. Um, you know, it's when I when I work with graduate students. The first thing I almost always have them do is I have them work through and walk through exactly how all of the processing of the agricultural product works. Um, so, uh, you know, they talk about the farmer's share of the dollar. If you've ever heard of that, um, people complain that the farmer's share of the dollar is only 14 cents. Um, and 
I, they, they like to say that that's because the farmer is getting squeezed, right? But, but the reality is that the thing, the system is so much more complicated and requires unique marketing logistics top to bottom throughout. Okay, so, so there are all types of things that have to happen before it actually gets to that end consumer. Uh, you know, COVID makes it su super hard, you know, value added creation, why has it been dropping? All right, let's, let me just jump to promotion. I think that's the thing that people maybe, maybe do. So farmers tend to be really bad at this, uh, in my experience. So like my granddad lives in Laverne, Oklahoma. There are less than a thousand people that live in Laverne, Oklahoma. It's a wonderful, beautiful, little small town, but my granddad doesn't really like people, he, he likes like his buddies at the co-op. He likes his, the, the people at church. Uh, but, but he's not really a people person. Uh, he likes maybe some persons, but like, I've seen that guy walk into Wichita, Kansas and be overwhelmed. And that's not even a real city. So, so like, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's not in a lot of farmers natures to think about this part, this, this relationship part. So the first thing you want to really focus on is understanding how to connect with buyers. So buyers to growers, um, you know, uh, in Michigan, we're a really big Christmas tree state. Um, I, I've been really encouraging the Christmas tree growers, especially to really focus on their Instagram, because I think Instagram is probably one of the most Instagram uh, Christmas trees, are one of the most Instagrammable agricultural products out there. Um, you know, I mean, you can take just beautiful photos uh, of a uh, of really nice Christmas tree you cut, choose and cut operations. Um, but you also want to keep an open mind about how social media might serve as this key function. Um, so you thinking about the personal use context and how you might actually like, I, I don't know, use and utilize different types of social media. So you want to be really strategic about, am I going to use Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, Twitter, whatever it is, I need to really understand and get into the, the weeds of who are the people that tend to use these the most. Uh, one thing that's probably good for y'all to know is Facebook just reported their first ever decline in monthly usership. So, so for the first time ever, Facebook actually has fewer users this quarter than last quarter. Um, so, so I, the reason I point that out is it's not clear to me that Facebook might is necessarily the, the winning strategy right now, um, especially if you're trying to address and, and connect with younger uh, consumers. Uh, I would probably lean into like Instagram and if you want to get real cool TikTok, but I mean, I'm 33 and I think I'm too old for TikTok. So I, I, I don't really understand how to use it. <laughs> um, okay. So the first lesson in social media marketing is that online, we're all way more narcissistic and we all crave more authenticity. So, so if you look at what the research says on when we're talking to people in person, 30 to 40% of the time when we're talking to somebody in person, we're talking about ourselves. So about a third of the time, it's a, it's a, it's a me, I'm telling you about me. If we go online, anyone, anybody want to take a guess at how, how much that jump happens? What do you think? What do you think the increase in talking about yourself is? 105. 80%. 80%, 80 of the time when somebody's posting online, they are talking straight up about themselves, uh, whether it's uh, their re reaction to some dumb news about Kim Kardashian or whatever. What they're really filtering through is, is them expressing themselves. It's this kind of intrinsic online narcissism. As an example, here are the top 10 most popular Facebook stories from 2014. Um, aside from number one, look at the weird questions that people were posting about in 2014. I, in my lifetime, have never and will never randomly ask somebody, what color is your aura? That's not a thing I will ever say in person. Um, I mean, maybe at a bar. I don't know. Probably not, though. That's a weird thing to ask. But the only reason you would post that quiz is so that you can tell everybody else about your aura. Okay, so, so like the way that we talk online and the way that we communicate with other people online through online messaging and marketing has to be different. Um, just because of who we are online or is just different than who we are in person. Um, okay, so the next thing that you have to take from that is that because everybody's super narcissistic, you aren't you cannot be narcissistic if you're a company if, if you're a business trying to promote your own stuff. You are in the business of trying to help other people tell their story. okay? So your customers are your biggest asset. You want to express their loyalty, you want to convey their your community. The goal here is to make sure that they do not feel like you are selling them a commodity. 
you are selling them uh, a community. You're selling them, you know, the, if you're trying to go for local, you really want to double down on how much you are a part of the community that you're selling. Uh, so we've got a paper on hard cider in Michigan where we looked at like what people mean when they say I'm buying local hard cider. So we had people choose like 600 different Michiganders choose between a New York cider and a Michigan cider. Michigan's the second, I think, largest cider producer in the country. And then we measured local by a bunch of different ways. Mileage, uh, you know, there are parts of Michigan that are farther from where I'm sitting right now than Washington, D.C. is from where I'm sitting. Michigan is a unbelievably large state. I, you might never think about it, but it is so big. Um, so that also means I'm only an hour and a half from the Canadian border. Um, there are parts of Canada that by, by mileage are much closer. If you're in Detroit, you can see Canada if you're looking south. Uh, you could basically, I don't recommend it, but the bootleggers used to swim it. Um, so, so like we are so close to Canada in terms of mileage. But if, if you start thinking about community in terms of mileage, you're missing the whole point of local. The whole point of local is community. And so we show that in the paper that really what you're trying to do is to convey community in your local food or your niche product. You know, niche in general, you know, like I said, Morels, that's another one that we're working on in, a, I think, the same story, second verse there. Um, so everybody wants to be the karate kid. Everybody does. When you watch the movie, you think you're going to be the karate kid. But when you start trying to market your product, when you start trying to promote your product, you need to think about yourself like Mr. Miyagi. So the goal here is to really think that you are going to be the person who is guiding them to tell their narcissistic story online. You're not, they, you don't want, they, they're not going to tell your story. You want them to tell their story that features you. Does that make sense? Because that's, I think, an important lesson when it comes to trying to use this stuff to the, the, to the advantage of your farm. Okay, so as an example, right before the pandemic, I went to this music festival with my, my now wife. Um, and so we went to Tempe, Arizona to go to this music festival. When I was there, they had all types of random stuff set up that are called like Instagram traps, where we took a photo. If you'll notice, this is me holding my wife at the, at the concert. Uh, we took a photo in front of this thing. And now y'all would have never heard of the Innings Music Festival ever. And yet here I am telling you about the Innings Music Festival. And even if I didn't use the word Innings Music Festival, you would see it on the photo that I'm showing you. They also set up kind of dumb things like, like this is me pretending to catch a ball um, in slow motion. Um, quite proud of that. Um, but but the, uh, the, the point here is that they were trying to set up a way where I can tell a funny story about me, but while I'm telling that funny story, by God, you're seeing their marketing. Um, and, and so when it comes to selling things, especially online or trying to develop a community online, this is a really important step of that process. Um, you know, thinking about their story more than your story is, I think, one of the best ways. Ideally, you connect their story to your story. Um, but that's that's kind of step two. Right. OK, so every story back to my story. Uh, there's a really great book if you want to read about kind of storytelling. Uh, it's called Building a Story Brand. Uh, it starts with a character, it has a problem, it meets a guide, it has a plan, there's a call to action and a success or failure. So when you start thinking about how you're going to try to develop these local food communities or these uh, these community niches, uh, you know, what problem they So if you're, if you're trying to start an urban farm, think about what's going on in the community, what's going on in the city. Uh, ideally, they're probably craving some nostalgia for like what that city might have used to be or something, um, you know, then you help them reconnect to that that system. So when you think about craft beer, where, where do the craft breweries usually locate in cities? Anybody? They locate downtown. They usually locate in the town in the in the the building that maybe once upon a time hosted the brothel or whatever, I don't know, like the, or the, the former bank or the whatever it is, because they're trying to connect and, and local beer consumers are trying to connect to their community through that beer. Um, you know, beer is intrinsically a community thing, um, but craft beer is even more of a community thing and a local community thing than, than you know, drinking beer in the garage with your buddies. It's a different thing. Um, and so when we think about urban farming and, and local foods, I think the, the same uh, application is, is very relevant here. 
Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about before maybe I open it up and we just kind of have a longer form conversation about all this stuff um, is uh, this idea of going viral. Um, so social media is super famous forever about people accidentally go viral for weird things. Um, so I think most people think this is what viral looks like. Um, so the y'all are familiar with the daddy shark, the dumb little jingle. Um, okay. So I, I, I was a camp counselor in Colorado for three years at the YMCA of the Rockies. We sang that song every single day from Monday through Friday, every summer. That was the a song that we sang and it was a dumb song then. And it's a dumb song now, but it didn't go viral. Nobody really heard it that much, except for if you were at a day camp. Um, you know, so, so what people think is you just create a product and then you just tell two people about it. Those two people tell two people about it. And then those two people tell two people about it. And it creates this like obvious clean web of how this, this stuff goes. It's almost like a pyramid scheme, right? So what it really looks like if you're going to try to go viral is this. So you share to as many people strategically as you can. And hopefully, ideally, you find one of these folks who are called what's called a maven, a sharer, somebody who has an online community that's already built. So that way you don't have to build the community yourself. You, you tap into a community that already exists online or in person. I mean, it, it, the same thing applies um, in person, but I think it's even more so online. So even though I sang this song as a YMCA of the Rockies camp counselor for years, I don't have the reach that the Pink Fong group does uh, in terms of making this stuff go viral. So it wasn't until the, the mavens of Pink Fong decided they're going to make this video and they're going to share it to their audience that this thing became every early parent's nightmare. Um, this, this is how this stuff works. This is how the thing traces through is you really want to be strategic about trying to find those types of folks to share your content. Um, you know, wh whatever it is, if you're trying to develop a relationship with the community, you know, that chamber might be a really helpful asset. Thinking about, uh, you know, the, the, the local historian actually might be a really helpful asset. Um, you know, somebody who understands the, the community itself. Uh, the reason I bring up the local historian is there's the, the Lansing Historical Society here has been really helpful in identifying like different places that might be, um, you know, historic landmarks in the, the, the kind of old school Lansing ag heritage that, uh, that was kind of pre Oldsmobile. Um, back to my Rust Belt thing, Lansing was the home of Oldsmobile. Um, obviously it doesn't exist anymore. So, so like, but there was a time before Oldsmobile. So trying to understand what that history was is very helpful to be able to accurately identify your kind of sharing attribute. So like the Lansing Brewing Company, for example, was a, uh, it says founded in 1898, but not really, you know, there was a Lansing Brewing Company and then it went out of business for like, I don't know, 60 years. Uh, so, so it's not, not the same company, but, but like it's in the same location. It's the same name. And it's, it's uh, got this historical heritage that maybe would be able to help you identify a way to go viral. So let me show you what kind of Oklahoma viral is. So like I said, I'm from a rural part of, of Kansas and Oklahoma. Uh, the family ranch is outside of Laverne. Um, so I, uh, I got married this summer. We originally were supposed to get married in, uh, we were supposed to get married in uh, the beginning, of, well, 2020, summer of 2020. My wife and I were going to get married. We'd had this beautiful thing planned in Tulsa at the, the Philbrook, the fancy Conoco Phillips place. Um, but it got canceled because COVID. Uh, and so we finally decided, you know, we've waited too long. The, there was kind of a lull in COVID. We didn't know what the world was going to look like a year from now or a year from then. So we said, you know what, let's plan this whole thing in seven days. So we got married uh, in our hometown or in, in my family's hometown. Um, we uh, I don't know. We basically had to scramble to get it all together. So in this small town, a hotel where all the old cowboy roll through. Uh, it has been closed and it's been confessed for at least 60 years now. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, Laverne, Oklahoma does not have very many people left. Uh, so this is the photo of it on the, on the left there uh, before. Well, somebody bought it and they're trying to renovate the main street in downtown Oklahoma or downtown Laverne. So they've spent a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of 
heartbreak and a lot of passion into redeveloping this place. Well, so we reached out to them, asked if we could use their hotel for, for part of the, the wedding. We got married at the ranch, but we needed people somewhere for people to stay. And this town has nobody in it. So, um, I mean, it's not super easy to find a hotel in this part of Oklahoma. But they said, absolutely, you know, they helped us out. Well, I am pretty good at this online marketing thing. So I reached out to KOSU, the NPR station, uh, and they were willing to let us do an audio diaries on the show. Uh, this is this is me dancing with my mom, by the way. Um, but so we got really good photos, uh, you know, and we got to really talk about uh, with the, the KOSU people what's going on in the uh, kind of, I don't know, rural Oklahoma communities as it relates to these big celebrations that, that just couldn't really happen for a year. Um, and, and so that was pretty good free publicity and advertising for this hotel. And that was just me doing a thing that I'm telling my story. I'm telling them about my wedding, but I'm also talking like crazy about Laverne, Oklahoma and how awesome this hotel is. Um, so th this is an example that, you know, I, I think can translate um, where like what you're really wanting to do is find like something that's super unique and, and you really want to pump it up. However, it is by letting your customers and your consumers tell the story for you. Um, and, and so this is, I think, the, the next step is how do you make your consumers or your customers feel like they're a part of your community? For this hotel, it was really easy. I never met the woman that runs it before in my life, but I know the town really well. And I feel like I'm a part of that community already. Um, you know, for y'all, if you've got people who are from Lincoln, Nebraska, or moved for college from to Lincoln, Nebraska, and never wanted to leave, well, that's a built-in network of, of people that you might be able to tap into. Um, you know, th this to me is, I think, the, the key step for how you might be able to sell your, pri your products at a higher price. Now, how do you identify that price? The first thing you need to know is your cost of production. Because without your cost of production, you have no idea whether or not you're making money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you can guess, but like you have no idea. <laughs> so, so like that's an important first step to understand where that price is. And then the next step is understanding what your customers are willing to pay for it. And that requires a relationship in this niche product stuff. Because if as soon as your customers feel like you're trying to hose them, it's dead. It's done. It's hard to come back from that. Once you break that trust, it's, it's really hard to come back from it. So what the punchline is here is that you don't have to be for everyone. Um, this is maybe more of a personal thing, and, and I'm willing to argue this, like have a conversation longer term. Um, I think CSAs struggle with this. Uh, so a CSA model can be a challenge because you are trying to raise a bunch of different products for a bunch of different people. Um, you know, and, and if you can develop a community and the community aspect of the CSA is what is really at the core of the value, then, then we're playing the right game. But if we're just trying to say, oh, we grow all of the things for you and anybody can be a part of it, you know, and you don't really have to participate in the farm or whatever. Well, that's a different story now. Um, one of my favorite conversations that I, I think is, is maybe the weirdest thing for an ag producer is, is that there's a, there's a guy in Idaho outside of Boise that does online dating. So you sign up to pull weeds at his farm and you pay him to pull weeds at his farm with eligible bachelors and bachelorettes from the Boise area. So, so like, he's actually, I mean, like he doesn't have to be for everyone because anybody in their right mind shouldn't be paying to pull weeds. But like what he is, is he's trying to identify the people who would want other people to pull weeds with, within a community. Um, and it worked out pretty well for the guy. I, well, it had the last time I checked on, on the, the business model. But the point here is that you really wanna be very specific especially with niche production about not trying to do all things for everybody. Uh, anybody ever been to a restaurant where they have too many things on the menu? Um, you know, where, where you go, you show up to the restaurant and, and they're like, you, you ask what's good here. I've never been here before. And they say, well, everything is good. And they have everything from like tacos to pizza to cheeseburgers to uh, sushi. And you're like, I, I, this is not helpful to me. I don't like, I would much rather them have six things that are great because then they can say everything is good or they have a thing that they're famous for. That would be even better. Um, I think I mentioned that my, uh, my dissertation was on um, beer. The focus of that dissertation was that there's an explosion of options right now. And so what we wanted to understand was how choice overload plays into the, the, 
decision-making process to buy uh, agricultural and food products. Uh, and so I convinced a bar in Stillwater, Oklahoma to double their number of beers on tap. So, um, you know, in my, it was a wine bar, by the way, in Stillwater, because what better group of consumers to have choice overload for beer than wine drinkers in Stillwater? So I, I doubled the number of beers and I could actually decrease the chance that somebody would order a beer by increasing the number of options that I would provide them. So if, if there were too many taps on, they would, the consumer would basically say, never mind. I just, uh, I think I'll just go with a wine. I, I don't want a beer. Um, I could turn that off though, by helping them with a little bit of information. So third-party certification can play a role here. So uh, Global Gap is probably not a bad idea. If you're looking to try to get some type of certification for your small farm, I think uh, like there are plenty third-party verification systems that will give you a little bit of a, a leg up when you actually try to go make a relationship for the first time with uh, you know an institutional buyer, uh, even you know consumers. They want to see maybe some label that that indicates that there is some quality threshold that y'all are maintaining on on farm. Uh, there's also like rating systems that exist. Uh, so so for beer, there's a beer advocate score. So if you go into the the beer ad, or a brewery and they actually have the beer advocate score on it. Uh, that's them trying to help you make a choice on what beer to drink. Um, so, so this, I think, is also relevant here because what you want to do is be very specific, trying to target, and then you want to help them understand how they're, A, a part of your community, and B, you are super good at what you do. And don't take my word for it because, of course, I'm going to say I'm good at what I do, but take this other person's word for it because they also indicated that I'm good at what I do. Um, for the hop industry, we even created the Chinook Cup. So we have a big trophy that like our, if you grow the Chinook cultivar, we have Founders Brewery and some of the other breweries actually vote and they pick the best grower for that year. And so that's another version of a third party verification system that actually indicates that there's a higher quality here. So how do you find these people? How do you, how do you say, okay, I don't, I don't know who I'm trying to sell to. This feels overwhelming. So you need to be as strategic as possible. So you want to think about the geography. So what's the supply chain look like for you that will allow you to get things to the right people? You also want to think about your demographics. Uh, you know, who, who are the people that like to eat this product? Uh, for the tart cherry industry here in Michigan, for a long time, uh, tart cherry pies were the, the, the mainstay of the industry. Um, that's starting to pivot dramatically because people are looking for health conscious products and younger people don't eat pies like, you know, like, like older generations did. Uh, so there's been kind of a decline in, decline in pie demand, especially that high sugar, the five plus one, uh, you know, they just dump a cup of sugar on tart cherries is, is how a lot of the pie filling gets made. So, so like that has changed a lot. So you want to be thinking about the age, education, gender, marital status, income. These are things that you really want to be at least somewhat clear about who you're trying to go after as a consumer psychographically. Are you thinking about people who are relative to new products? Are you thinking, all right, this is, our business is going to be really trying to welcome the new people into our community so that we can teach them about our community, get them engagement in our community, and, and really make them feel like they're a part of something bigger than just living here and getting a paycheck. Uh, that's, that's a whole thing then, you know, is it that, so in, in uh, Arkansas right now in Fayetteville, they are, it's, it's unbelievable how many people from California are moving to Northwest Arkansas. And if you go look at a lot of the promotional material they're putting out, it's pretty dang obvious that they're targeting those people too. Um, as somebody who's moving down there, it's killing my, like the, the prices down there are crazy. It's so Californians are just the worst when it comes to what happens to real estate values. Well, if you're trying to buy, if you own it, it's wonderful. But, but the, 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 the catch here is that they are being very specific. Uh, think about your niches. You know, are we talking about, Parents with young children, which I think the Christmas tree promotional board oftentimes looks at. Um, there are ways that the university systems can help you identify these folks. So if you could form a community like uh, uh, somebody was talking about the specialty crop block grants, uh, these are things you could maybe consider for some of these grant projects or grant funded projects that, that maybe you say, all right, we have this industry we're trying to develop. Uh, let's try to work together to be more strategic and specific about the types of people that we're trying to focus on. Uh, so we've done that with hops. We've done that with uh, Christmas trees. We've done that with cherries. Um, you know, this is, this is a thing that's, it's, at least in Michigan, is a very doable project. 
um, to, to really try to work with your university and your extension leadership to try to find a way to fund projects to understand these, these specific fields. Um, so, so this is something that I think is very doable, but it, it needs to be very deliberate. Um, it's, it's hard to just accidentally fall into a niche. Okay, so the last thing that I wanna point out is that you really wanna be focusing on taking advantage of what's called the mere exposure effect. Um, so this is something that, that uh, is, is all in, it's a behavioral economics 101. Okay, so the exposure effect is this idea that people tend to develop a preference for things just because they're familiar with those things. Um, so like I, my granddad, he drinks coffee at the co-op every Wednesday. He brings the donuts. The coffee is from those bun coffee makers that, have, that make the like watery, terrible coffee. But that is the coffee the man drinks, period. Um, don't give him an Americano or an espresso or something. He wants his bun coffee because he drinks that bun coffee every Wednesday. Um, and so he has a preference for that because he has exposure to it. With music, it's the same deal. Um, so the Hey Macarena, I know basically none of the words, but I'm sure all of you know the words because it's played on the radio all the time. Uh, Gangnam Style has uh, billions of views. Uh, I also don't speak Korean, but I, I at least know the beginning of that song because it's also something that went viral. And there is a preference that is developed over time because it's, an, it's called an earworm, if you've ever heard of an earworm. Think about it the same way when you're using social media marketing. So what that means is that you really want to try to put out as much content as possible. So there are, there are different months that you can promote things. So right now is the National Cherry Month. So we're, we're running a massive marketing campaign about the research that we've been doing on tart cherries. Uh, people love to see farmers in action. Uh, if there's a mistake on your farm, like something weird happened, you know, like, a, I don't know, some implement breaks or, or something happens, uh, why not post it on social? I mean, just you want to be posting more than you feel like you should be posting. Uh, one way that you can do that is by actually purchasing something like Hootsuite or a, 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 a scheduled out program that will actually let you just post, like set up when things are going to come out and then post them uh, in real time. Uh, if, if that's something you're even also not interested in, there are plenty of people that you could contract out to do that for you. Um, there are social media marketing firms and everything else that you could probably just pay to do that for you. Um, I think that it's really nice to do it yourself because it creates this opportunity for, again, social, social media. The first word is social. So, so it gives you the chance to actually be social with the people that you're trying to connect with. Uh, if you're just outsourcing your marketing, you're trying to give this top down communication where what you really want to be developing is that social community aspect to, to any type, especially crop production. Um, you know, if, if you're trying to, uh, Contracts also, contracts are going to be a whole lot easier if, if there's a, a, a social trust that's developed between yourself and that, that uh, small business that's, that's there in town. Um, actually, I, was, I gave a talk at Creighton a few years ago, and uh, in that talk, that was a big part of the conversation, was, uh, was kind of the development of relationships um, with people in hops. Uh, and then I went to a burger place in North Omaha. They claim to have the best burgers, but the reason they could claim to have the best burgers, they, they had their third party verification, but they also had, um, you know, a whole story about who they pro or they get their meat from. Uh, and they, they clearly had a strong relationship with that people, with that group of people. And they could tell a really compelling story about how they know that their quality beef gets to them in a way that they can tell a story about and sell at a premium. Um, so that's, that's kind of all I had prepared. Uh, or at least that's all I really wanted to talk about. Um, I'm, I'm more than willing to field conversation questions. I'm easy to get a hold of too. So if you wanted to just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, feel free to reach out. Um, I mean, I've been working on this type of stuff for about five years, um, like directly with people in Michigan. And uh, so it's, it's different, but I think there are a lot of like overlapping trends when it comes to, um, you know, making decisions on farm about how to, to actually reach your end audience. So thank you very much. Um, Appreciate your time. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Are there any questions uh, from anyone here? We have about uh, six minutes left on our schedule if we have any questions. You can feel free to unmute those or share those in the chat and I'll read them aloud for us. Not a question, but I just, a lot of good stuff there. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks. Trey, this was remarkable. What an outstanding presentation. It is not what I was expecting, okay? But okay. It, was, it was enormously <laughs> valuable. Well, thank and, you. Um, yeah, you have given me more to think about than I can even wrap my brain around at this point. One of the things that we're dealing with here in Lincoln is that for the, the minimal local food operations that we do have with the number of producers and with the number of markets, you've got all these people fighting over 10% of the market. Okay, the other 90%, these are people, they're, not, they're just not interested in any of this stuff, all right? And so what we've got to do is we've got to figure out better ways short of collapse and everybody you know, having food shortages and all of a sudden they're interested in eating anything that they can get their hands on. We got to find better ways to be reaching out to that other 90% to hook them in on something because right now they're way too happy with processed food that comes from the global food system. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question, or, or maybe you just fight fire with fire, right? Um, you know, one, one thing that I've thought about with farmers markets a lot is um, so, so I think a lot of people in, in, who sell in farmers markets think they're competing with grocery stores. I don't think that's true. I think, I think, well, I think it's partially true. But, but in economics, we talk about um, complements versus substitutes. Um, and if anybody's ever heard the word elasticity before in economics, what we're generally talking about is, is what the relationship is between price of one product and either the demand for that product or the demand for another product. So if the price increases a beef like we've seen right now, what does that do to uh, the, the sales of poultry, for example? Um, so I think that there's actually a stronger relationship or you're competing more in a farmer's market with movie theaters <laughs> than you are with Walmarts. Um, so, so in my mind, I, I think that there is this social aspect, this community, this, it's just fun to go to a farmer's market, right? So, so like, why do we have to feel like we're coming at the, at the Walmarts? Because the, the, you're right, there's a lot of people that just don't, like, it's not a thing. But what if we, what if we sold, like, like here, uh, the craziest thing where I think the second largest blueberry state right now. We might be the number one right now. I don't know, but we're on where we, we grow a lot of blueberries. If you go to Meyer, which is our Walmart, um, that blueberry, it's Michigan grown blueberries. It is sold super cheap. If you go to a farmer's market, it's way more expensive. Why do you think that is? Well, it's because blueberries are super easy for me to chow on while I'm walking around a farmer's market. Um, so, so like there is this social aspect that is affiliated with being able to buy something that I can eat in, in like almost an entertainment value while I'm walking around and talking to farmers. Um, and, and this is, I think, part of the, this community aspect of local foods, um, that it's, it's, it's part of it is shortening the supply chain, but a lot of the value in shortening the supply chain isn't the mileage of the food that's traveled. It's in the relationship that you can develop with the consumers between the farmers and the consumers. Because then you can have the conversations you want to have with individuals who are at some level kind of happy and excited. Um, so, so like to me, it, it, there would be a lot of value in really understanding like at these farmers markets, direct to consumer sales. You are, you are the front lines, and this is true for all of agriculture. I wish agriculture would think this way. When you go to a uh, choose and cut Christmas tree operation, uh, so here, I, I think y'all probably have choose and cut Christmas trees where you can go out there and cut your own tree. Um, so odds are, that's probably the only time that person has ever been on a farm in their entire life. Um, I mean, here, Metro Detroit is a very big city. You drive outside in the country just a little bit and you can cut down your Christmas tree. Odds are those people in Metro Detroit will never be on a farm again, aside from your choosing cut Christmas tree or, or farm. So, so like you are the front lines of being able to communicate agriculture to the people who are coming to your farm to learn. Uh, the farmer's markets are, are <laughs> they're behind enemy lines, right? We're not even talking about being on the farm. We're talking about being in that urban atmosphere and being able to develop those relationships. So, so like to me, like let's double down on making those friends and trying to tell the compelling story about agricultural production. Um, I mean, I, I love this industry as you might have, have guessed, gauged by the way I get about this. Um, but I, I, I would just really recommend that, that, that you think about it more like I am trying to develop a relationship with these consumers and I'm trying to develop a relationship such that they are willing to pay a premium to maintain that relationship and keep me in business. 
John, how you, you so doing much. on how you doing on time, John? Uh, well, we have about a minute left, but oh. you know, if, if Trey wants to stick around, well, we, can, we can continue questions I, during our lunch. I, I was just going to throw something out there quick to kind of tie into Trey based on another life where I worked at an ad agency. Um, you know, just to give you an example uh, to Kay and Tim's uh, dilemma of, of having this small group they're trying to reach, you just need to find out where they're at. Yeah. and uh and know who your audience is let as he was talking i came up with just a crazy idea that kind of gives you so he was talking about the christmas tree people well someone who's willing to go out and cut their own christmas tree probably might be willing to go to a farmer's market and might be willing to to buy even canned goods so why doesn't a produce grower talk to a christmas tree person and ask if they can go out there during that season set up a booth or have flyers or something to indicate where they're at. So that's, I just wanted to throw, that's, that's where you have the creative thinking. One other quick thing to give you an example. So if I asked you way back when, when McDonald's started and it was a huge hit, whoever thought Burger King could make a go of it? Well, Burger King decided to offer something different. But what amazed me, if you go and look, when Burger King started, where did they build every one of their restaurants? right next to McDonald's. And the reason they did that, not only because they offered something different, but they knew McDonald's had done all the research on traffic and the best place to build. So they took advantage of McDonald's research. Same thing you could do as a produce grower, you know, see where that, there's a lot of organic restaurants. There's a lot of places like that. So uh, I know you're short on time. So I just wanted to throw that out there to kind of get people thinking. The coolest thing I've seen in the last year for, for what you're talking about is uh, there's a floriculture operation here in Michigan that they set up booths at breweries. So they drive around to different breweries and they sell flowers at the breweries. So like when I when I go get my beer uh, and, and my wife uh, gets a little tired of me going to go get my beer, uh, I can at least come home with some fresh cut flowers. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there are ways to do that. <laughs> very Thank you all very much. I appreciate your time. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. So you can stick around in this room. It won't close, but uh, we're in our lunch break until one o'clock. Uh, and so you can just hang out here. You can go back to the, the main room and just mute yourself, turn off your video, and then join us back again at one o'clock. Trey, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, I, I had just, just a comment, not a question, but I want to say sure. that this, this presentation really kind of hit home for us um, at Root and Hive. Um, niche marketing is kind of one thing that we really focus on because I, I bought a green a greenhouse nursery um, and mm. we lease each greenhouse to another grower and um, kind of finding niche markets where we don't step on each other's toes has been kind of one of those um, fine points of and then um, me holding the the business in general um, and trying to find you know how do we market you know, a group of growers, but the idea is that everyone is close enough together that we all learn from each other type of thing. And so cool. um, this was just, yeah, it was really poignant. So well, I think, thank you. so one, one thing that like, I, I, my whole take right now is that like niche is the new local. Um, the, so one, one of the, I think the fatal flaws of the biggest hop yard in Michigan is they, uh, they name their yard in my local. Um, and the problem is that right now, um, you know, we've, we've done a bunch of research with founders and we found terroir effects in beer. So basically where you grow the hops fundamentally changes how the hop or how the flavor profile of the beer is. Um, yeah. And uh, so if you, like, like if you could market that, you know, as being like, well, this is a Michigan pale ale, you know, you have the New England style IPAs or whatever. Well, this is a Michigan pale ale because it has Michigan Chinook. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so then, then you can like tell the story that's not just Michigan local. It's uh, is everybody now. Uh, I mean, you could have a Michigan pale ale in Chicago and it would sell pretty dang good because Chicago loves Michigan product. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's like one of these things where like, how do I develop a niche? Uh, well, it's really understanding specifically who that customer is. And there's a ton of overlap, uh, you know, like the, I think millennial, uh, like Christmas tree buyers, millennial moms right now are just looking for that Instagram worthy thing uh, to go to the farm and cut it down. And they'll yeah. pay whatever you tell them to. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. 
I yeah. mean, we've, we've benefited from, so we, we have a grower that just does native um, plants from, you know, basically the Midwest. Um, mm. But we, you know, people have known the property to be a nursery. And so they'll come, you know, looking to find veggies or whatever. So it's been benefited our other growers who grow just veggie starts who then kind of bounce over. And you talk about having kind of that presence um, through well, the other challenge is having you don't want to do too many things. So we just published a paper in agribusiness where we used eye tracking to uh, like so we set up a bunch of different um, uh, potted plant displays. And then we had people in the like glasses for eye tracking and we basically asked them to pick one of the plants to buy. Uh, and so as we systematically kind of increase the complexity of the display, people looked at fewer and fewer of the plants. So, so at some point you're just making it overwhelming for people and they might even just stop out. So like, like you might think, well, I'll give them all these options, but like anybody that's on Netflix can tell you that like, if you give people too many options, now I'm just going to watch five minutes of the Netflix movie and then change the channel. Right. Um, and the same thing happens when people are trying to make a choice in floriculture. Like, I think it's cool to go see a bunch of options, but your average c- consumer, they don't know anything about floriculture or horticulture or anything else. Just yeah. give them a nice one. <laughs> you know? <laughs> sure. Have you looked at the, the amount of money that people are willing to pay for direct ship, um, like horticulture products, like plants no. and everything? No, we haven't. It's insane. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that the greenhouses here are kind of mad about is that like, you could just drive to your local greenhouse and buy a potted plant, but somehow like there are people online are willing to pay four times as much, five times as much for a direct ship product. It's, it's yeah. crazy how, how much that like online, especially with, with floriculture and horticulture is, is like, why, like, I would want to see it before I buy it. Right. Because there's like variation in each of the plants. Um, but, but it's really not playing out that way in the marketplace right now, which I think is fascinating. I think that's, that's interesting too, because I follow a lot of nursery production online and, um, the, the biggest con- uh, concern or comments are always pictures of FedEx shipment showing up and they're just upside down or yeah. they're, I mean, they're completely destroyed. And, and I think the idea of shipping a product out and then having some sort of guarantee on it sounds a little nightmarish. Uh, super risky, but the amount of money that these companies are generating on potted plant sales, um, because they're so good at the Instagram marketing, especially because yeah. it's kind of a link in the bio kind of thing, you know, here's this beautiful plant. And then there's like, I think some implicit trust there, right. Of the supply chain that you have, that'll actually get the product to them the right way. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that, that doesn't mean that you couldn't do it. Right. Like you think about yeah. like, like from Nebraska, how many people move from Nebraska, like Omaha down to Kansas city? Um, you know, you could just try to crush the Kansas City market with like some remember this, this, I don't know what the plants are in Nebraska, but, you know, this is like a, a thing the the state plan of, of Nebraska. Uh, and now I'm just well, like I said, Estes Park, Colorado. Why are there yeah. two UNL stores in Estes Park, Colorado? Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the freaking mountains majesty. And all of a sudden I got to see the damn M for knowledge everywhere. Right. I, I st- I'll never understand it. Uh, but like, if you just find these people, you can sell a lot of product. <laughs> yeah, there is, there's Nebraska loyalty. I, I lived in Dublin for a short time and there was actually oh. a bar in Dublin that was Nebraska themed. You're kidding so, me. You no. Know? So I'm, I'm going to the, I'm on the scientific committee for the beer economics association. So like, it's a, it's a real thing. It's the economics of beer. But, uh, so, uh, our conference is in Dublin, uh, this summer and I haven't been able to travel like at all cause COVID. So I'm, I'm really excited to get to, to Dublin. Yeah. I sure hope I don't end up in the damn Nebraska bar. That, that would just. <laughs> <laughs> you might find it. You never know. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, thank you very much for the comment. Uh, I want to appreciate the talk. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Thank you all. If there's no Thanks, other questions, John. we'll let Trey go. Thank you very much for, for popping on and helping us out. And it's been crazy getting here. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we, we have an event today. So it's getting her done. Yeah. Well, hey, I mean, it seems like you got a lot of attendance, which is really good. Um, yeah. So, yep. And we'll have an we have an in person day tomorrow. So we'll see. We're going to we're supposed to have about 80 or 90 people there. So, wow. That's that'll great. Be, that'll be good. Congrats. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. Awesome. See you. See ya.